This video looks at how you would introduce constraints when you're doing GPC with a T-filter. So the constraint code and development on the previous video was focused on a simple GPC algorithm. However, we did note in Chapter 3 that in many cases you might want to use a T-filter if you had a Karima-based GPC algorithm in order to get satisfactory responses when you have measurement noise. So this video will look at how the algebra and code will be modified to take account of a T-filter being used in the predictions. So summary then of what we did in the previous video. We said you had a quadratic performance index, something like this, predictions like this, constraint inequalities like this, where that was the definition of the constraints. And I'm not going to go through those in detail because that's in the previous video. So that's a simple GPC. What changes when you add a T-filter. What you remember is GPC had predictions like this. When you have a T-filter, you'll notice the bit that depends on the past. You get a subtle change. You get a P-tilde matrix instead of P, which multiplies on a delta U tilde past rather than delta U, where if you've forgotten, delta U tilde was essentially defined as delta U over T. So it's a filtered variable. And you get the same issue with the Y, Q to Q tilde, Y past to Y tilde past. So we want to ask ourselves, how does this change the QP we want to solve? Well, first of all, the change of the QP is relatively straightforward. The performance index is relatively straightforward. The quadratic bit is the same, no change. But you'll notice the linear bit, this bit, changes. We've now got this P tilde delta U tilde past Q tilde Y tilde past instead of P delta U Q Y past. And so therefore there's a change in this parameter A here. And that's the only change in the performance index. So when we calculate that A we have to use the new formula not the old formula. But that's relatively straightforward to do. What about the constraints? Well again you'll see there's a very subtle difference but it's minimal. You'll see in here we have P tilde, in here we have Q tilde instead of P and Q, and multiplying delta U tilde past Y tilde past. So at first sight you would look at that and you say it looks almost identical. Well it is almost identical, same structure, but just remember to replace the P by P tilde, Q by Q tilde, and so on. And therefore when you construct the inequalities you'll notice now these two depend on filtered past variables, not absolute past variables. But again, you'll see the changes are quite subtle and very simple. So now, if we put everything together, you'll notice we've got a quadratic performance index. This bit looks the same. The only subtlety is that A is computed slightly differently. This bit looks the same. The only subtlety is that this DDU and DY are slightly different, and I've got these delta U tilde past and Y tilde past. But otherwise, you're looking at that saying it's pretty much the same as I had before. So what about the MATLAB code then? So what we're going to do, exactly as we did in the previous video, all the steps are identical, which is why I'm not going through these. You can look at the previous video. The most important thing is to say, where is the code? So there it is. We've put it in MPC underscore simulate underscore t -filled. And the t -filled there is to help you separate that from the original file. Now, just to show you before we go through and do these. There are a number of different examples which you can look at. So for example, video 55, example 1. And if you go to the bottom, you'll notice the only difference with the previous video is now we're simulating with this t -filt option. And obviously, we're adding the t filter in. You can go and look at this file, MPC t filter, if you want. And you'll notice that it's almost identical to MPC simulate with only those subtle changes of using the filtered variables where we need to. If you want to run these files, again, you can just open them, press F5, and get the simulations. So they're all there. I'm not going to go and run them real time. You can do that yourself. OK, so the first example then, video 55, example 1. And you'll notice critically this is the same as video 54, example 1. And you get the same responses. You can check that yourself if you want. Why do you get the same responses? Because in this case, there is no 
uncertainty and you remember that when you add a t-filter if there's no uncertainty nothing changes you expect to get the same responses and that's what you see here then you look at the next one video 55 example 2 and again you'll see this should be the same as you had in 54 example 2 because there is no uncertainty and again we emphasize the point that these inputs don't meet constraints because the predicted violation was in the future and when you add the extra degree of freedom each sample that is then avoided and finally video 55 example 3 the multivariable example with substantial interaction but again you'll notice we've got the nominal case no uncertainty and therefore you should get the same responses as you saw in the previous video but you can check that for yourself what happens now if I add in output constraints? And again, you're reminded that when you add in output constraints, you might get infeasibility, especially when you have disturbances. So all we do is ignore the output constraints when infeasibility occurs. Now the file here you want is this one here, so it's a long title, but to make it transparent, MPC simulate underscore tfilt output constraints. OK, now what you noticed in the previous video is we had this large disturbance and it caused infeasibility. And we're going to get exactly the same case here. So there's not a lot you're going to observe here. However, you may find that there's a slight change in these signals if you look at them carefully. But we'll get to that in this next example. It will be easier. So large disturbance, you get infeasibility. You can't do much about it. Now, let's look at 5.5, five, example 5, which you'll see replicates 5.4, five, example 5. And the key thing is 5.5 five is with the T filter. Now, if you look at this, you will find you do indeed get a different response. So this is from the previous video. These pictures here are GPC. Perhaps I've put that in the wrong place because I need that plot. So these four pictures are GPC. So have a look and see what you notice. Look at the output response here, look at the input response here, the input response here. Now, if I run the same scenario with the T filter, what do you notice? You see that this output response is not the same as this output response here. OK, and if you look at this input response, you'll see it's not the same as the input response here. So when you've added in the T filter, you have got a different response. And we did talk about this in the earlier videos. You remember that the T filter changes the mapping of uncertainty. And in this case, we have a disturbance. And so the way it deals with the disturbance is different. And ironically, in this case, the T filters made things worse because we actually end up with an output violation, whereas we didn't with GPC. So <coughs> T filter doesn't necessarily help when you have low frequency disturbances, as we have here. It can actually make your sensitivity worse. What about example six then? What I've done here is I've added some noise, some measurement noise to the system. So if you look at GPC and then you look at the input rates down here, you'll see they're bashing up and down between the limits and they're pretty much on a regular basis actually meeting the limits so GPC is not doing a very good job of dealing with this noise now I accepted this noise is rather severe um, you know it's quite close to the magnitude of the output so but we've exaggerated here so that the impact is very visual now if you look what happens when we add the T filter you will see that the input is not bashing up and down quite so aggressively the amplitude is much smaller. So what we showed in the early videos is that when you add a T filter, you tend to get better noise rejection in the sort of, um, should we say, the linear case where there are no constraints. And what you find here is the same insight carries across to when you have constraint handling, so when you can't use loop linear analysis. So we have better noise rejection even during constraint handling. And that's one key reason why the T-filter is quite popular, because you don't need to rely on linear loop analysis in order to say my sensitivity carries across to the constraint handling case. And finally, example seven, if you want to look at that, this was the multivariable case. And again, you'll see if you look at this and compare it 
to what you had in the previous video, you'll see that the sorts of plots you're getting are different. The disturbance rejection is different to what you get when you just use GPC. So you look at plots like this and compare it with what you had on the previous video and you'll see they are different. So in summary, the video has shown how constraints can be incorporated using a T-filter and we've basically shown the MATLAB code is provided to demonstrate the results. The code, if you want it, is on the GPC folder. We've ignored advanced knowledge and the key thing you note is that the disturbance rejection and noise rejection responses are different to those without a T-filter. But in the nominal case, everything should be the same.